Welcome to our morning service on this second Sunday of Lent. There aren't many notices except to say that we are beginning to see the beginning of coming out of this wretched COVID. And the first signs of hope for us is that next Tuesday we will be starting morning prayer here in St George's at 9.30. So if you want to have a great change and come to a time of quiet and fellowship next Tuesday, 9.30, morning prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our first hymn this morning is Be Thou My Vision and will be sung by Naomi. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his, his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And the collect for this second Sunday of Lent. Almighty God, you show to those who are in error the light of your truth, that they may return to the way of righteousness. Grant to all those who are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's religion, that they may reject those things that are contrary to their profession and follow all such things that are agreeable to the same. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading will be read to us by Jill. A reading from the book of Genesis. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. And Graham will sing our responsorial psalm, Psalm 51. Have mercy on us, Lord, for we have sinned. Right 
Gospel reading will be read by Judy. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It's not often I start a sermon with a text, but today I am, and it's not from one of our readings. I want you to hold in your minds the words at the end of 1 Corinthians 13. Three things last forever, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Today's readings in the Old and New Testament are stories about faith. In thinking about this sermon, I realize that faith is a much more difficult concept for us to grasp than I originally thought. Since the Enlightenment, our beliefs tend to have been based on knowledge, facts, research, and understanding. Nothing wrong with that. All these are necessary for living in a modern, rational world. But faith is also important, for it point, points beyond the rational to mystery and uncertainty. To believe what can be seen does not need faith. You can see it. But to believe what you can't see and what does not have substance does require faith. The word faith is very closely related to the word trust, and most of our lives are based on trust. What is the difference between an acquaintance and a friend? Well, there are probably many differences, but the bottom line is an acquaintance is someone you know, but a friend is someone you trust. And the closer the friendship, the greater the trust. The friend who stands beside you when you're in trouble and the trouble is your own fault 
is the truly trustworthy friend. Friendship is not visible, it is not measurable, is not always rational, but friendship is vital and requires trust, or to use our words, faith. What is true of friendship is even truer of love. Now there is a much overused word and a word difficult to define. Love is beyond the rational. It is not about knowledge. It is beyond understanding. You can see the effects of love as you can see the effects of the wind. But just as you cannot see wind, you cannot see love. Without faith, or trust, love cannot exist. If ever so someone tells you that they can no longer trust their husband or wife, I know that their marriage is in grave difficulty because they no longer truly love the other. If there is no trust, no faith, then love is empty, like a clanging symbol, as St. Paul puts it elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is all about giving and receiving in trust. So even in this rational scientific age where we think everything has reasoned and is rational and measurable, it is in fact faith which underpins the love that makes the world go round. I want you to hold on to those thoughts. Now, to understand our gospel reading today, it has to be seen in context what happened before this incident with Peter. Everything has been going so well for Jesus. Jesus has been healing all and sundry. He has fed the 5,000 out of a few loaves and a couple of fish. The crowds are all on his side. Jesus and his disciples then go to Caesarea Philippi, a Roman city, and Jesus asks them, who do people say that I am? They answer, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah. Then Jesus asks the more pertinent question, but who do you say that I am? It's Peter, it's always Peter who answers, you are the Messiah. Now the Messiah in Jewish tradition was a God-sent figure who, with might and power, will liberate the people of Israel and defeat the enemies of God. However, however, Jesus does not commend Peter for his confession of faith, but rather gives strict instructions that they are to tell no one about this. This must have been very puzzling to Peter and the other disciples. If you are the Messiah, the anointed king, Surely you should be shouting it from the rooftops or giving a speech on primetime television or tweeting endlessly about how great you are. But it gets worse. Jesus then goes on to tell them what is going to happen to him. He is going to undergo great sufferings and rejection and be killed. Now, unsurprisingly, this is more than Peter can cope with. And he takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. No, Lord, you've got it all wrong. You're the Messiah. You're not going to die. You are going to defeat the enemies of God by sheer power. Now, Jesus rebukes Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You think as men think, not as God thinks. That is a real rebuke. That's the put down of all time. As bad as this is, it gets even worse. Jesus now gathers not just the disciples, but also the crowd of followers, you and me. And he says, if you want to be a follower of mine, you must take up your cross and follow me. At this point, we have to try and think ourselves back 2,000 years. From our perspective, the cross is a symbol of Christianity, prominently display, displayed from a mountaintop in Rio de Janeiro, as well as outside and inside churches, right down to personal jewelry. It is attractive and comforting. When my father died, I was still in college, 
By the time I heard of his death, it was too late to get a train back to London. So that first night, I was not with my family, but alone in my room in Bristol. As you can imagine, sleep did not come easily. And I lay awake. As I lay awake, I noticed for the first time in four years that the stone lintels that divided the panes of glass in my window were in the shape of a cross, picked out by the moonlight. That cross was a comfort, and I knew Christ was present, and I slept. If I had lived at the time of Jesus, or at the time when Mark's Gospel was written, the sign of a cross would not have brought me comfort and hope, but rather fear and trauma. For the disciples and the early Christians, the cross was a symbol of the most cruel and despicable form of execution known to man. The cross was not used to execute people of status and power or wealth. It was the method used to dispose of the scum of the earth, the common criminal, those of no consequence. For Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed, the Son of God, the King of Kings, to talk about dying on a cross is incomprehensible. And when Jesus says, to be a follower of mine, you must take up your own cross, they don't hear what he's saying. It's too frightening. They're in denial. Or rather, they have heard, but they don't want to hear or understand. Jesus is in fact saying, the love of power is nothing compared with the power of love. I'm going to give up my power and die for love of the world. And the disciples just don't get it. Let's not be too hard on the disciples. For most of the time, neither do we get it. In fact, if I'd been one of the crowd following Jesus, I might have given up at this point. What's the point of following somebody who, instead of using his God-given powers to defeat our enemies, gives up his power and hands himself over to be killed? I can hear myself saying, this guy's a loser. I think I'll follow somebody else. Now, this guy Mammon is doing very well for himself. I'll follow him instead. But the disciples, for all their lack of understanding and their abundance of fear, don't do that. They stay with Jesus and go to Jerusalem with him and live through the passion of that last week, the week we call Holy Week. Now that takes faith, and that's what the disciples had. They didn't understand. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they kept faith in Jesus because they trusted him. Faith is what keeps us hopeful when we are bewildered, hurting, frightened. Faith is what keeps us loving when we feel alone, rejected and threatened. Because it's then that Christ comes closest to us. And we, like the disciples, are also the recipients of a promise. That Jesus will love us and remain with us to the end of time. Faith is believing just that. This makes us like Peter. You don't have to be a saint or even special to be a person of faith, for you already are special. God in Christ loves you with a passion and will be with you wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever you experience, till the end of time. How much more special can you get than that? Jesus can come alongside us because he is not floating on a spiritual cloud protected from the realities of the world. He comes alongside us because he suffered those realities and still bears the scars of the cross. Have faith in that truth and you will have hope. Live in hope and you, be you can begin to love with a deep, all-accepting love of Christ. Faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love.
Amen. Following the sermon, we're going to have a piece of music to reflect on today's message. And Sarah will play the first movement of Sonata in A Minor by Corelli. say together the creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Ian will lead us in our prayers of intercession. Holy Father, whose Son Jesus Christ fasted 40 days in the desert, give us grace to discipline ourselves in humble submission to your Spirit, that we may lead upright and holy lives to your honour and glory. We pray for your worldwide church. May it spread the word of your love and compassion to everyone who would listen. May it bring help to those in need and comfort to those who are suffering. In our own parish, we pray for our own ministry team, led by Richard, and we pray for the continued recovery of Ifani. We particularly give you thanks for our team of non-stipendary clergy and lay leaders who work tirelessly fulfilling the pastoral needs of our parish. Give them strength to carry out your work and spread your message of love and forgiveness to the people of Forest Hill and Sydenham. We especially give thanks that we are able to consider reopening our churches for public worship once more, and for the work of the DCC in bringing this about. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for the people of the world. We pray especially for peace and reconciliation in all war-torn countries around the world. For the people of Myanmar suffering under military rule and all those suffering under oppressive regimes. We ask that you have mercy on the souls of all those killed in conflict and we remember all refugees who have lost their homes and livelihoods through war, famine or drought. Give strength to the aid workers bringing relief and setting up refugee camps in very difficult conditions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the well-being of our local community. We ask for your strength and guidance to the head teachers and teachers and governors of our local schools, especially at this time, having to plan for the safe return of all pupils to school. Give them the power to inspire the young minds in their care, to grasp the opportunities before them and to live their lives to their fullest potential. We thank you for the community of which we are part, for those who share with us in its activities and for, for all who serve its various interests. Help us, as we have opportunity, to make our own contribution to the community and to be good neighbours that by love we may serve one another. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We pray for those who are suffering. Let us remember those who are sick or suffering, all those suffering from coronavirus, either directly or indirectly through the effects of the lockdown. And we pray especially for June, Betty, Ifanwi, Margaret, and Denise, and anyone else known to us personally. We pray for those who have died recently, especially for the soul of Egbert Warmington and anyone else known to us. And those whose year's mind occurs at this time, for Jocelyn Rivet, Dennis Soul, Eve Water, Thomas Watts, Thomas Walter, Leonard Whitehead, Bob Exley and Leonard Johnson. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. Circle the sick and the bereaved in your healing presence. There are some we know who are simply not well some who are fearful and in pain, some who are on their last journey. Circle them, Lord, in the healing presence of Christ. May, they may the touch of Christ be for them the touch of wholeness and healing. Circle them, Lord, keep peace within, keep fear out. Do not be afraid, I will save you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the deep waters, I will be with you. Your troubles will not overwhelm you. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We come to the peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I'll give you a wave. And Naomi will now sing the anthem Holy, Holy, Holy by Franz Schubert.
is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. We say together the prayer Christ taught his friends. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, be with you all evermore. Amen. And Naomi will sing our final hymn, Jesu, lover of my soul. to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.